goodness. Yeah, I hope you enjoy the opportunity. I know I do to just worship freely before the Lord. I know that's not a, a common thing in, in many churches. I'm not trying to put down on any of them or, or try to exalt the fact that we do it as if somehow that makes it okay or magical or something and others don't do it. Uh, every church is responsible for its own um, worship and ministry and guidance, and it's not left up to, uh, to me uh, to criticize or whatever it might be. I just, I just like the way we do it because uh, it, you get an opportunity uh, to worship truly and, and, to just, and to not be searching for words and, and, and how to say things, but it just the, the, the re- repetition of that just becomes something that your heart fills up with and your mouth is speaking this to him, to the Lord. Instead of talking about him, we're talking to him. Yeah. Um, just like David did when he went through the valley of the shadow of death in the, in the favorite verse that everybody in the world seems to know, even lost people, the 23rd Psalm, where he says, uh, David says, uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And then he says, uh, and yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, all of a sudden it's not he talking about him. He says, thou art with me. Thy, thy rod and thy staff. In other words, it gets real personal real quick. David stops talking about God and starts talking to God. So I'm telling you, when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll start talking to him instead of talking about him. And that's what we offer. That's what uh, uh, Justin and and Pastor Tanya and and our praise teams, that's what they offer a lot of times when when we go into that spontaneous type of worship is it it, it stops talking about him and starts talking to him. And that's an opportunity for us to enter into that and to have a unique time with the Lord. So I hope you take advantage of that. We're, we're entering today into, I think, a blessed time as a church. Um, it's because of the Lord's promise of this. I know that most people aren't aware of the fact that God says he will bless you if you read this book. He will bless you if you hear this book read. He will bless you if you keep the things which are written in this book. And so many, many churches, many Christians never receive the blessing that God promises us uh, through this book because this book is probably, and I wrote it in your outline that I gave you, those notes I gave you. Really, it's not really an outline. It's really just some notes about what I'm going to say to you today, um, which, by the way, is going to be pretty common during this series, you know what I'm planning to do? I'm planning to go verse by verse, which simply means that I'm, I, I may have an outline sometimes because those verses may, you know, form something that could be an outline like a point A, B, C, or one, two, three. But a lot of times it's not going to be an outline because it's just going to be some things I want you to see and take home with you so you could have a little information that will help you when you read this again sometime in the future or the notes you write beside them in the column will help you see the truth about this because my, my, uh, my object in sharing the book of Revelation is not to give you a bunch of cute outlines of what it's about and kind of the little uh, uh, quirky uh, visions and, 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 and cute points about the book of Revelation. But I, I really want the Lord to use this to unveil, to remove the covering, which is what the word revelation means, actually. It means to something that has previously been covered, something that has been, that has been hidden, uh, apocalypsis, to, to, to take that covering away, to remove that which is hindering sight into those things that, have, that God has revealed to us. So the book of Revelation is the unveiling. Everybody say, uh, make it open. You see, there are people that don't study the book of Revelation because they don't think they can understand it. Well, to that, God says, that's just a trick of the devil. The devil's telling you, you can't understand. I'm telling you, the reason I gave the book is so you could understand. 
God wants you to understand this book. He does, this, is, this book is not intended to be mysterious and baffling. This, this book is to be understood by us. Some parts of the book, according to the book of Daniel, as an example, Daniel received visions from the Lord in the Old Testament. Daniel was a great prophet of God, and he received visions from the Lord, and Daniel started to write these visions down. If you read the book of Daniel in the Bible, and God said, no, 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 seal that up. In other words, quit writing that stuff because it's not for this day. What you saw is not for this day. And these people are not intended to understand that. But it is written for a day yet to come. And so Daniel had to just quit writing whatever he was writing. And all we know is that he saw the future. He saw prophecy, but God wouldn't let him write it because God says these, it's not for these people that you are ministering to now. So just seal it up and shut up the words. Well, what was, re what was veiled to them is not veiled to us. What was covered for them is now uncovered for us. That generation that was not intended to understand that, Christ hadn't even come yet. The prophecies were not for them, but it was for a latter day. And I'm t looking at you and telling you, we are the day. God has opened these things up for us. And we are meant to understand the book of Revelation. So many, you know, would read the book and say, fanatical is he who reads this book, or mystical is he who reads this book, or confused are they which study this book. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, blessed is he. You are blessed if you read this book. This book actually begins with a blessing, and it's the only book in the Bible that ends with a blessing. It begins with a blessing in the first chapter in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads this book, who hears this book, and who does the things written in this book. In the last chapter, it says, blessed is the man who hears this book, who sees this book, and who does the things that are written therein. And, and, and so all the books of the Bible are blessed. But this is the only one that promises at the beginning and the end a blessing for those who hear this word and, and put this word in their heart and obey this word and do this word that God is going to bless your life. So I submit to you that one of the reasons why Christians have been steered away from the book of Revelation, and it is often the most neglected book in the Bible, People know about it. People hear about it, but, but people don't read that book. Why? Because their idea is, I can't understand it anyway. It's, just, it's really too confusing, and I don't even know what it's talking about, and I don't have the maturity to understand. And so they don't read the book because they think they can't understand. They think that maybe God wrote it in such a confusing way. One of the misconceptions about about how the book is written would, would be, and I know you've probably heard this before, that um, John was on the Isle of Patmos who wrote the book. Who, who, well, John didn't really write the book. God wrote the book, <laughs> okay? God wrote the book, and John tells you that about 15 times in the first 15 verses. He said, look, I'm telling you, I'm not writing this stuff. God's just saying it. God's just showing it. I'm writing it down. I mean, I, this is not from me. This is from God. This is from he who, who is, who was, and who is to come. I, it's God the Father is just dictating this to me, and I'm just writing it down, man. I'm a stenographer. I, I, I'm, I don't know any more about what he's talking about than you do, okay? So, so I'm just writing it down. And, 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 and so many people believe erroneously that John was on the Isle of Patmos and God gave him this vision and then he started writing it down and using all of these symbols and these numbers and all these events and all this Jewish stuff and all this temple stuff and all the ways that, that the Jews would understand certain things and everybody else wouldn't understand certain things. In other words, there is a, a, a type of belief out here that, God, that, that, that John wrote this to be confusing to people who were not Jews and would not understand the symbols of this. And, and that's just erroneous. That, that's just, uh, that's not what happened at all. What happened is God said, I'm going to give you everything you need to write and you just write down what I say to you and what I reveal to you. And God didn't care whether the Romans understood it or not, you know. He's had a word for us. 
They obviously didn't understand it, but it wasn't written that way on purpose to be confusing to somebody who couldn't understand it and get past the censors, so to speak, the ones that would read it and get off the island. As a matter of fact, and I don't want to blow your mind, but there is a, a, some question, theologically, some question whether John was on the aisle when he wrote it. It's not a question of if he was on the aisle when he received it. But there is a question, okay, well, did he write it down immediately on the aisle or did he wait until he got off the aisle and then write it down? I mean, so th that question is not even answered. There's no really, there's no way to answer it because we don't know. But we do know that it was received on the Isle of Patmos because it says it was. But when it was written, I don't know, maybe he was only on there for about a year, year and a half. I mean, it wasn't like John was a prisoner for 50 years on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, you know, Domitian, the Roman emperor, hated everybody and wanted to be called God and was a big part of this Caesar worship deal where the Romans had said, uh, Caesar is God, Caesar is Lord, and they demanded of all their citizens that the first thing that would come out of their mouth in anything concerning the government was Caesar is Lord. In 96 AD. Caesar is God. This book was supposedly written in 90, around 95 A.D., and, and, and Domitian died in 96. And then the, the next, uh, uh, the next uh, Roman general, Roman uh, Caesar that came in, I think it was Vestry or something, then it, I can't remember the exact name, he, turned, he overturned all the laws of Domitian and released all the prisoners. So by 96, here comes John going back to Ephesus to be back with his church and all of that kind of stuff. And and yet, the book of Revelation had been given and inspired by God. And, you know, whether he wrote it down exactly when he was out there or whether he was on, uh, going on the way to Ephesus, it, psh, who knows. But the point is, who cares? Uh, it, it, God gave it to him, and God said, write these things, and he wrote these things so we could understand, so that it would make sense to us, not so that it would confuse us, not that it would be harmful for us, but that we would be blessed. And many people are never blessed by this because they are afraid to read the book. So therefore, the, the enemy of our soul encourages us not to read this book. So it has become the, one of the most neglected books of the Bible. It is the only one that begins with a blessing to you if you read it and ends with a blessing saying, you just keep on reading it, you keep on hearing it, you keep on doing it, and I promise I'm going to bless your life because of this. And the devil keeps saying, no, he's not. It's too confusing. You're miss you, couldn't miss you couldn't possibly understand it. And, and so Christians neglect the book of Revelation. And then it has to be the most misunderstood and then misrepresented book. There are all kinds of translations, all kinds of uh, visions about this book, and, and there are all kinds of understandings of the book, and so we're going to just have to go, and we're going to have to let the Lord lead us, and that's what I plan to do. <clears throat> I don't have an agenda. I don't come with a mindset about, okay, I'm going to try to teach this view. There are about four views to the book, and I don't care what four there are. I mean, they all, they all have good points and bad points, and if you're interested in that, get on the Internet and type in four views of Revelation, and you can read all about it. It'll bore you to death if I started talking about it. Um, so, but it doesn't, and it doesn't matter because it says what it says, and, and we need to know what it says. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go a verse at a time. I've given you the basic outline of the book, and I want to just kind of flash through that for just a second. Wouldn't it be great if... There was a way that we could begin to understand what the book of Revelation is all about. Because if it's been given by God for us to be blessed by, and God says if we'll read it and we'll, and we'll hear it and we'll understand what is being said, then we will be blessed. It's going to help us. It's going to encourage us. It's going to give us information that's going to be vital to us to be prepared and to be ready. You know, I mean, that's, uh, it's good. Well, wouldn't it be nice if there was, an, if there was a, 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 a key to help us understand the book so that we wouldn't just get all mixed up and not know what the book was even trying to do? Well, there is a key, and it's found in the very first chapter, and it's the 19th verse of the first chapter, which God himself tells uh, the apostle John to do this, and I wrote, wrote it in your outline, 
He says, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall, uh, shall be hereafter. In other words, write the things that you have seen, write the things which are, and then write the things which shall be hereafter. Let's, let's read the verses. We'll just start with verse 1, and let's just see. And, and I want to read these uh, without stopping to give you any paraphrase or anything about them. Just, just read the first eight verses. That's all we're looking at today. Let's just read them and see what they say. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servant things which must shortly take place, and he sent and he signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And all of us can say, Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's quite a beginning, isn't it? <laughs> That's quite a mighty word from a mighty God who says, hey, I'm giving this to you because there are some things that you need to know. And Jesus Christ, I'm giving it through Jesus Christ. In other words, it comes right out of the heart of the Father. It comes right into the heart of the Son. You know, Jesus, when he was on this earth walking around in Matthew 24 and 25, you know, you get that, that part of, of, of the ministry where the disciples ask Jesus, what are the signs of your coming again? What are the signs of the end of the age? And what are the signs of when everything's all completely over? And then Jesus begins to give them these signs, which we're going to look at those signs, by the way, as we move along through here. The things that Jesus said would be happening so it would signify when all of these kind of things are going to begin in life, you know, and Jesus just looks at him and says, now I can tell you about some of the things that are going to happen in those days, but there's one thing I can't tell you. I can't tell you when it's going to happen because the Father has not revealed this to me. In other words, Jesus was saying, I would tell you if I knew because if God wanted me to tell you, he would have revealed it to me because everything that the Father has given to me, I have given it to you because I want you to know. But right now in this earthly form I'm before the crucifixion, I don't need to know that. You don't need to know that. So the Father hasn't revealed to me. He, I know everything that's going to happen, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, but I just don't know when it's going to happen happen because it's not left up to me. And so, and so we didn't get an answer of when it's going to happen. Well, in Revelation, Jesus has been crucified. Jesus has sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat of God. Jesus has now become a part of the Godhead. He has sat down on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And now he knows everything. He knows when it's going to be. He knows what it's all about. And so here is Jesus in the book of Revelation, God saying, I'm giving it to Jesus. And then here comes Jesus giving it to you through the Spirit of God and translated through John, this wonderful person who we're now speaking through. And, and so we're going to see what happens in these last days and how co close these things are. And so in chapter 19, uh, of chapter 1, verse 19, John says, uh, uh, Jesus says, all right, here's the outline. You write down the things which you have seen. Let me put this up on the screen because some people didn't pick up notes, I don't think. There it is, verse 19. And, and just look at, look at uh, the divisions, 1, 2, and 3, the things which you have seen. That's the first command. Write the things which you have seen. He's talking about the past. So the first thing that we see in the book of Revelation is, what did John see? 
Well, what John saw, obviously, was John saw Jesus. John saw the one who he knew 60 years ago, for it's been about 60 years by the time John writes in about 95 AD. It's been around about 60 years since John saw Jesus in person. And when John saw Jesus back then, John saw a Jesus that was a suffering servant. John, John saw Jesus that was a crucified Savior. John saw Jesus that was gentle and meek and mild. John saw Jesus as God who had come to this earth to perform gracefully and, and to save souls and to be merciful and all of those kind of things. And, and that's what John had seen. But this time when he sees Jesus, it's an altogether different Jesus. In chapter 1, Jesus is not coming in riding on a donkey into a city waving palms. Jesus is on a white stallion with a sword in his hand and fire in his eyes to execute not, not a cross but but a, but, but a, a, a recompense, a, a, a judgment against us, you know? I mean, the first time Pilate, Jesus stood before Pilate. This time, Pilate's going to stand before Jesus because Jesus is not coming in the book of Revelation to be the suffering servant. Jesus is coming to be the conquering judge, and there's nothing about grace in the whole book of Revelation. I say it, Amen. The book of Revelation, I, I know that we'll be looking at numbers. And there are several numbers, and I don't want to jump out here and confuse you right off the bat, but since I mentioned to you there's no grace in the book, uh, th there are various numbers that come up over and over and over in the book of Revelation. There are actually 18 different numbers that come up in the book. All the way through the book, there are 18 different ones, and some of them are fractions like one-tenth, one-fourth, one-third, one-tenth. And then there are other numbers like 144,000. That's the ones that are sealed to preach the gospel. You'll understand it when we get there. Then you have 1,000, you know, because it's talking about the millennial kingdom, and then you have numbers like 42, and then numbers 24, like the 24 elders sit on the 24 thrones. And then the numbers that are more consistent, the number number four, the number uh, six, the number seven, the number 10, the number 12, those, those come up multiple times all mixed through the book, and they all mean something. You know, we say, God, let, I mean, just to come and let you reason with me, and let's see if this doesn't make sense to us. I mean, when God, when, when, when God gives a number, uh, that's part of his word. Do we believe that every word that God speaks is truth and has a purpose? And that God inspired the Bible, not just the concepts of the Bible, but that, John, that, that God inspired the very words of his book? I do, too. I don't believe God just inspired concepts. I believe God, uh, 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 what is it, Thessalonians that says um, that the holy grammata, which means God not only inspired the words, he inspired, inspired the letters of the alphabet that make up the words. That's how chinky it is, you know, and God inspired them. And so I'm, what I'm getting to is if the numbers were given to John, specific numbers like there were five of these or there was three of these or there were 12 thrones and 12 elders set on 12 thrones and we had 10, of the, 10 horns and we had, you know, we had, we had the number of the beast is six, the number of man, six, six, six. And we, I mean, you know, if, if all of these were given by God, that means they mean something. He didn't just reach up out of thin air and go, uh, no, let me see. Well, I asked about 10 of them. Okay, yeah, about 10. Right down about 10. No. No, he was very precise, and that word means something. So if he's given numbers, these numbers mean the same thing every time we see them. So we can understand some of the things by what these numbers reflect, like the number four is the number for the earth, the world. There are four directions, north, east, south, and west. There are four angels that sit in the four directions of the earth. Four always means something worldly or something earthly. Six is the number of man. It's one short of seven. We, all, we, all, we come one short of God. We need, we need the number one, which represents holy, which represents God, to be added to the six so that we can be seven because seven means completion, and it means the complete plan and revelation of God or a completion of a purpose. And number seven is all through the book. It's ridiculous. 
And then the number eight is the number for new beginnings. The number 10 is the word for testimony. A tithe is one-tenth of your income, and, and one-tenth tenth is a testimony. So when you tithe, it is a testimony of the fact that God rules in your life. And then 12 is perfect government. Why did Jesus had 12 disciples? There were 12 apostles. There were 12 elders that sat on 12 thrones. And then double that, 24, which is just a doubling of 12, which is an intensification of the government established by God. 24 elders and 24 thrones. Do you see what I'm meaning to you and saying to you? Well, let me tell you one number you won't find, the number five. And you might expect to find the number five in the book of Revelation because there are 18 different numbers. You would figure that at least once in the book, five would come up. Five is the number of grace. It represents the grace of God. And the, and, 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 and the grace of God, the number five, never, look at your person beside you and say, not one time, does the number five appear in the book of Revelation? which means there is no grace. There is no mercy being preached here. There is judgment. There is the wrath of God, the hand of God on a world that has rejected him. The book of, book of Revelation is about getting your comeuppance. I don't know if that makes sense to you. An old phrase we used to say is, you're going to get your comeuppance, which means that one of these days you're going to get what you're giving out here. It means one of these days justice is going to fall and you're going to receive justice for the things. And, and what the book of Revelation reveals is that, is, is that this world finally gets it, what it really wants. What this old world really wants is sin. And they, they love sin and they desire to sin and they want to sin and they don't want to repent and they don't want to acknowledge God and they don't want to control themselves. They want sin and more sin and the more the merrier. And so God takes us out of here and says, all right, I'm going to give you everything you wanted. You wanted sin. I'm going to just blow this place up with sin. And you can sin as much as you want to, and you can sin wherever you want to. And for years, there is nothing but sin on the earth until that day finally comes where God said, all right, that's all it's going to be, and we're going to bring, we're going to bring the hammer against this. This is the end of all of that. And the book of Revelation is about these things. What happens when these happen? What happens in the meantime? What is Jesus all about? And so the book writes about things that were. What had John seen? John had already seen Jesus Christ. He gives him a view of Jesus Christ. This is the first part of the book. It is the very short part of the book. It is only one chapter. There is only one chapter, the chapter one, about the things in the past, the things that John had already seen, which was Jesus. Then he says, write the things which are. The things which are last a little bit longer than the first one. It lasts for two chapters. Chapters two and three are about the things which are, the things that are present on the earth when, when John is writing this. What is present? Well, the church age is here. The churches are here. While John is writing Revelation, there are churches just like there are churches now. We, 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 we are in the present generation. Jesus coming on earth was the past, the things which were. The things which are is about, okay, write about what is current. Write about what is happening, and so the Holy Spirit begins to tell John about churchy things. And John begins to write seven letters to seven churches about churchy things, about how the church is, about what the weaknesses of the church are. Really a natural outline. Let me just give it to you. And, um, and of course, when we come to the churches, we'll go down through there and, and, and look at them. And they're all named for us. Let me just give you a couple of thoughts. The first one is the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus is the only church in the whole list. You know, there's Sardis and Thyatira and Laodicea and Pergamos and whatever other. I, I, let's see, um, uh, Smyrna. Yeah, that's the martyr church. And Philadelphia. How could I forget Philadelphia? Church of brotherly love. Uh, you know, revival church. 
But anyway, Ephesus is the only one that receives both an epistle and a letter. The book of Ephesians is written and carried by the Spirit of God to the church at Ephesus. Ephesians was written to a church, the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus receives a letter from the apostle Paul. And then the church at Ephesus is mentioned in the book of Revelation and gets a letter from Jesus. Why did church? He doesn't really have anything. Here's the outline of every church. This is what Jesus does in every church. Jesus tells them what's right with the church. Jesus tells them what's wrong in the church, and then he tells them what to do about it. And these letters, these let seven letters to seven churches, the seven churches, what does seven represent? Seven means complete. Seven means perfection. So these are not only seven physical churches. Everybody say, these are real churches. Okay, I don't want, I mean, these are not fantasy made-up churches out in the cosmos somewhere. If you look on a map in, the, in what is current-day Turkey, and you look on the beach side of Turkey, you'll find these seven churches just really in a very small geographic area. Uh, it, it, it's kind of like California, the area they're in. I mean, it, it's beachy, the weather's great, the climate's great. Everybody wants to go there and be in the sun and the fun and swim and all of that in, in Turkey. And, and here are seven churches, and these are the seven churches. I know it says seven churches of Asia Minor, and I know some of you's eyes roll back in your head when you saw the word Asia Minor because it reminded you of history, and you said, I hate history. You know, because Asia Minor sounds like an old word, right? It just, it just it, Asia Minor means it's in Asia, but it's in a small part. It's not like the whole continent. It's in a minor, you know, the little small area. Uh, located, you know, in Turkey and, and near the beach and all of that. And so Ephesus is mentioned and what's right with it, what's wrong with it, and what to do about it. And then he goes to Smyrna. What's right with Smyrna? What's wrong with Smyrna? And what are we going to do about it? Then he goes to uh, Pergamos and he t- says, what's right with Pergamos? And what's wrong with Pergamos? And what are we going to do about it? And what this represents is it not only represents seven churches that are real and going at that time that meet every one of these things that are said, but it represents all churches of all time and all ages. This is the things that happen to churches. And if you can see yourself in one of those, then listen to what the Spirit of God says about what needs to happen in your life. You lost you, you, you left your first love. I love it when he talked to Ephesians. He said to the church at Ephesus, he said, you, these things are good about you. And then he says, but yet I have one thing against you. You have left your first love, he said. He didn't say you lost it. He said you left it. In other words, you chose to walk away. Somebody didn't come take it from you. You let your first love grow cold. And you know what he said to him? He said, here's how you get it back. Remember from where you are fallen, repent, and do the first works again. In other words, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to throw this in for free, all right? You having trouble in your love life? You having trouble with the person you love or you feel like you're burning low? You feel like this is really a, you know, you, you've lost the old magic and the old everything. And somebody says, I don't know if I love you anymore and you don't act like you love me like you used to and all of that kind of stuff. Let me give you some counsel from the Word of God in the book of Revelation. There was a church that God said the same thing to because the same thing was happening in that church. Jesus didn't say they didn't love him. Jesus just said, you don't love me like you used to. You have left your first love. In other words, boy, you used to be hot and passionate and real. Boy, you used to love me, you know, like you're supposed to love somebody. And over the years, you've just drifted away. So it's not that you don't love me at all. It's that you don't love me like you used to. God, we could make a song about that. Probably... (laughs) Probably it probably already is one or about ten of them. But you don't you don't love me like you used to. And 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 he so he, so Jesus, you remember I told you he says what's right, he says what's wrong, and then he says what to do about it. So what do you do about it? He says remember from where you have fallen. That means remember what it was like when you did have a hot heart for each other. Remember what it was like on your honeymoon night. 
Remember what it was like when you would see them uh, standing at the door and you were walking up there to pick them up for a date. Remember how your heart jumped in you and the passion was there. Remember when they sat down in the car and you reached over to hold that hand. Remember how nervous you are about trying to put your arm around somebody. Remember how, how many times you, you questioned yourself and you fought against yourself to get to, to, as to whether you should kiss them goodnight at the door. You remember, you remember that. You remember, how, you remember how awkward you felt and, and you didn't know if they wanted you to kiss you or not, and, 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 you know, and, but you really wanted to and then you'd be going back to the car and say, Dad gum, I should have done it. I, you know. And then you're beating yourself up and all of that. And then remember that magic time when, when your lips did touch and it was like, whew, I mean, it just fluttered down in your heart because this person meant something to you. You, you loved this person. And your heart reflected that. And, and God said, all right, if you're burning low in your love, what you do is you let your mind remember what it used to be like and say, man, I was real. Oh, my Lord, yeah, and just fantasize about what it used to be like. And then he said, repent. He said, remember from where you have fallen. Repent, which means to turn around. Repent does not mean to say I'm sorry. To say I'm sorry is not repentance. To say I'm sorry is just a confession, a confession of your error. To repent means to actually do something. Look at them and say, you got to do something. All right, what does repent mean? Have you, ever heard, have you ever seen a military parade marching or a military group and you hear the, the first sergeant say, about face? Well, he could just as easily say, repent. Because it means the same thing. It means stop going the direction you're going and turn around and go the other direction. What is that saying? That is saying whatever you're doing that is causing you to lose your love. That's right, B. Stop doing it and turn away from it. If you're looking at other women on the Internet, if you're, if you're in the bars flirting and convorting with other women that that, you know, is, 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 is causing you to lose your first love and leave it? I mean, if, you're, if it's the next door neighbor that is provocatively uh, alluring you, I mean, if it's somebody at the daycare center when you go in that they're always kind of flirty, we, we, I mean, whatever it might be that is drawing you away from your first love, get away from it. Stop doing it. Quit feeding yourself that. Turn away. Remember what you used to do when you had a hard, hot, uh, a hot heart. <laughs> not, yeah, not easy for you to say. Um, and repent. And then here's the key: and do the first works. In other words, now do what you were doing when you did have a hot heart for God. Walk in there and hold her hand, kiss her on the cheek, tell her you love her, go out on dates, treat her with, treat her with respect and honor. To honor your mate means that they're put on a pedestal. I don't care what this old crazy world has to say about stuff. I mean, the world is ridiculous. Who cares what they say about stuff? We all, we all love somebody. We, 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 we honor them, and to honor means we lift them up and, and give her the best stuff or give him the best stuff and, and, and start doing what you used to do when you did have a hot heart for each other. And if you do this, you can rekindle your first love again. That's just a little advertisement for first love. I don't know who might, who might need that, but if you're in a relationship that's burning low, there you go. Here, here, here is God talking to a church that's having the same problem with him that you're having with each other. And I'm just telling you what he told them to do and what he told them to do ought to work for you too, right? Yeah, the book of Revelation, the revealing of things that are going to bless your life, not confuse you, not frustrate you, not cause anxiety, this book is a book about Jesus Christ. This is not the revelation of St. John. If you have that written on the top of your Bible, I know many of you don't even have a Bible anymore. A Bible is, we used to have them, they were called books. And the book was, it has little pages, little white pages. There you go, Brian, hold up that. That is a book. 
That is a book right there. And that's called the Bible. And when you turn the pages, it has different writing on the front and back of different pages. And it's different, and, it, and it's written on there. Well, the last, when you get to the book of Revelation, at the top of the book of Revelation, authors and, and, and uh, translators through the years have put a heading up there on the top of that book. And sometimes the heading says, The Revelation of St. John. Or the revelation of the Holy Spirit. You need to take a pencil and just cross it out. Because the very first verse, the very first line says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of St. John. It's not the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which means this book is going to reveal Jesus Christ. The book was written to reveal Jesus Christ. The book is about Jesus Christ. The book is not about the tribulation and the battle of Armageddon and the millennial kingdom. This book is about Jesus Christ. It's about what is Jesus doing? What is Jesus all about? What is Je how is Jesus going to be involved in our future? What is Jesus doing while all this evil is on the earth? What does Jesus plan to do? I'm telling you, if I get my way, I'm hoping that, I, that, that, that every message that I preach is going to be about Jesus. I mean, I know we'll talk about the tribulation. I know we'll talk about the millennial kingdom. I know we'll talk about, uh, you know, churches, and we'll have all kinds of symbols that pop across there. But what it book is all about is intended to reveal Jesus Christ. That's what the book is about, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ about himself. And so, and, and so John will say, Write the things which are, that's the seven letters to the seven churches, chapters two and three. And then the things which shall be hereafter is talking about future things. So he, he wrote about past things, one little chapter. He wrote about present things, two little chapters. And he wrote about things to come, future things, all the rest of the chapters. Chapters four through 22. Most of the book is about what comes in the future. It's interesting, and I say, and I put it as a point of interest on your notes. You can see it written. I put a little asterisk and said, oh, point of interest. All of the chapters in the book of Revelation, this is just one of those little amazing things. All of the books in the chapter, all of the chapters in the book of Revelation begin with and, A-N-D. You know what A-N-D does, right? It's a conjunction, right? Which means whatever it started in this chapter is, is hooked to whatever was just said in the last Every chapter begins with and, A-N-D, except three chapters. Chapter number one does not begin with and. Chapter number two does not begin with and. And chapter number four does not begin with and. So the first chapter is about what was, second chapter and third chapter about what is, and the fourth chapter through the 22nd chapter about things which shall be.